Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here at this year's ISS R&D conference. Um, any opportunity to head to San Francisco is a good one in my book, uh, but to be here this week and learn about all of the research taking place on the International Space Station, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Jackie Waddles. I am a journalist and breaking news reporter at CNN Money, um, and I focus on many items related to business. Um, but over the past couple of years, I've focused heavily on the commercialization of space. Um, so I love covering rocket launches, but I'm also so excited um, for the opportunity to learn a little bit more about why we venture to low Earth orbit and the work that they've done on space station. Um, so this is precisely why we're having the session today. Um, and I believe the title is officially commercial utilization of the International Space Station. Um, but commercialization can mean a lot of things depending on who you're talking to. Um, so if you're talking to some folks at NASA, what commercialization means is they typically refer to companies like Boeing, SpaceX, Northrop, um, and whom all hold government contracts to enhance our standing in low Earth orbit. Um, so if you were talking to folks at CASIS, who manage the ISS National Lab, they might tell you that commercialization means not only those rocket companies and those facility partners who continue to expand on the commercialization of station, but they also include a growing list of commercial research partners who are building demand for why many of these other partners mentioned are interested in developing a business case in low Earth orbit. So we'll touch on a few topics. Um, we'll ask what it is about the microgravity environment that makes this such an interesting research case for opportunities um, for commercial companies and others. And um, we, as we've seen, commercial space um, has opportunities for companies that we think of as having nothing to do with space and not even tech and research development. So um, we'll look at those companies and what they're investing in and why. So I'm joined by three individuals on my panel today. Um, so I'm excited to introduce them. The first one is Blair Bigelow, who is the co-founder of Bigelow Space Operations. Um, which is a subsidiary of Bigelow Aerospace, where she holds the title of Vice President of Corporate Strategy. The mission of Bigelow Space Operations is to market and operate space stations developed by Bigelow Aerospace. They presently work in coordination with NASA and International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory, managed by CASIS, to bring awareness and research opportunities through their service modules. Blair also manages both companies' marketing and public relations. So where's Blair? Should we bring her up? And then we have Derek Shuttleworth, who is a program manager in the External Science and Technology Programs Group at Goodyear Tire and the rubber company in Akron, Ohio. Uh, Goodyear is one of the world's most recognized brands for manufacturing tires for most types of vehicles. And within his role, Derek is largely responsible for much of Goodyear's new tech development. So Derek. And then Gary Marty. Gary was a last minute substitute on today's panel. We appreciate him stepping in. Um, and he serves as the principal product engineer of the Delta Faucet Company based out of Indianapolis. Um, Delta Faucet makes residential and commercial faucets uh, for kitchens and bathrooms. And I believe they were also part of a water sustainability workshop that was held a little bit earlier in the week. And just this morning, Delta Faucet announced plans to send a research payload to station, which we will learn more about in a moment. Um, so let's welcome everyone to the stage. Can you hear me? Everyone hear me okay? No, it's not on. What about now? Good? All right. So let's get started. Um, Blair, I'm going to start with you. Sure. I would love for you to just give us a little bit of an overview on um, everything that Bigelow has been doing, where you are right now, and also explain to our audience, since we're looking at this from a commercial and business perspective, as um, a company that's taken on a lot of risk and um, is in an industry where it's very capital investment intensive, if you can tell us a little bit about your business model. Sure. So um, Bigelow Aerospace was established in 1999. Uh, we started, we broke ground in 2000 uh, in northern Las Vegas where our headquarters are located and since uh, the inception of our company we've really been pioneering the expandable habitat technology 
So we've operated primarily as a lab for uh, most of our history. And um, we launched BEAM to the, to the International Space Station about two years ago. And BEAM was a tech demo that we're very proud of and has been operating very well on the ISS. And uh, most importantly, we have been working on a, a spacecraft that is an entirely autonomous standalone space station that gets to space in a single launch. And that program's been going on for about a decade now. And that vehicle is called the B330. And it's quite an incredible asset. So we're, we're hard at work continuing to, to develop that platform. And uh, most recently, this year, we stood up a company called BSO, Bigelow Space Operations. And we recognize that not only building a space station is an incredible challenge, but operating and selling services for a space station is an enormous challenge as well. So we decided to split those functions into two separate companies that require incredibly different skill sets. And so that's the charter of BSO. And our first order of business uh, is to fly commercial payloads to the International Space Station. We are lucky to be a, a partner of CASIS and a user of the National Lab, and we're excited to be continuing that work. Awesome. Um, and then I want to head over, oh, I have some random papers that I don't need. Um, and then let's head over to you guys. Uh, Derek, I know that you guys um, have an announcement as of today about a research payload you're sending to station. Do you want to just give us the introduction, let us know? Yeah. Um, so through our um, engagement with CASIS, we were able to uh, develop some ideas originated by our internal scientists to study how we might make new forms of silica in microgravity. And so the experiment that's going to be launched is designed to do just that in a very small scale um, to create a, a morphology or a shape of silica that's not available on Earth. And uh, we're interested in that because silica is an important ingredient in pretty much everybody's passenger tire right now. Uh, and so we, it's an opportunity to learn about new shapes, morphologies that are not available here on Earth that might direct our um, research back here uh, to, into different forms previously unachievable. Gotcha. Okay, more follow-up questions for both yeah. of you. But um, Gary, let's go over to you as well. Um, you also have an announcement as of today about a payload that Delta Fawcett is planning to send to the International Space Station. Do you want to tell us what it is? Yes, uh, we are sending a special kind of a fluidic chip instead of a typical needle jet in the shower, we use a fluid chip which actually is an oscillating uh, device that breaks up water into bigger droplets and they move faster. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows us to use less water for the feeling of more water. Mm -hmm. And doing it on the space station would allow us to see have we met the boundaries of that system. So as we see uh, flow rates continue to lower drop and drop. Right now, it's, it used to be three gallons a minute, then it went two and a half, two, now it's 175. There's areas that use a gallon and a half, gallon and a quarter. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we can give our customers the best shower they can with the fluidic technology that's available to us. And we don't know what the boundaries are. Mm -hmm. So putting this on the space station, being able to do the testing will tell us, hopefully, <laughs> if we can improve beyond what we have today. Gotcha. Um, so let's stick with you guys just for a moment, since these are new announcements. And obviously, when you're talking about commercialization of low Earth orbit, the interest from private companies that are willing to do you know, different research and decide to invest in this type of research opportunity. Um, I was hoping you guys could talk, um, and Gary, we can start with you, um, if we can talk a little bit about what was the genesis for this project. and. Where in the line and, and Delta Fawcett's um, R&D did you say, you know what can make our shower heads better, let's send something to space? Yes. Well, we, we had no clue that we can actually do this on uh, the space station. It was just never crossed our mind. We had a guy who worked at Delta who knew somebody who worked at L Eli Lilly. And Lilly has sent multiple payloads up in the space station. And they said, you should send some stuff at the space station. And so we started looking at it and we're thinking, you know, why? <laughs> and then we realized that there is some good benefits you can come from. If we could max out this technology, 
and, and improve it to a point where we can better use the water that's available to us today, I mean, that's a benefit for everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where that came about. It started from Lily, went to Delta. We started looking into it and realized that, yeah, this is, this is worthwhile doing. <laughs> Right, and, and Derek, why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened at Goodyear? Yeah, um, so it was um, actually is an interesting process that uh, took place with us. We were introduced to cases uh, just a few years ago, and um, the way the path it took with Goodyear was that uh, cases came in and made um, a couple of presentations to our scientists. Mm -hmm. about just what can be done uh, in microgravity. Not only microgravity, that's what we're interested in right now, but the different environments that are available in, on the ISS as a, as a national lab. Mm -hmm. And um, that, those discussions germinated, people thought about it and, uh, and thought eventually um, one individual actually did some background in the literature and learned that um, a couple, uh, in the days of the space shuttle that uh, a, an experiment had been done with a material that's of interest to us, I mentioned silica, mm -hmm. and um, it seemed to uncover something pretty unusual that we might like to take a better look at. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, then, and that was the start of it. And so then we get back to cases and say, well, we think we've got something that we'd like to test out. Um, how does that work? And then various back and forths with Cases, who uh, helped us with a, an implementation partner. And, um, and so we're hopefully going to launch on, on the same uh, mission that uh, Gary's uh, equipment will go up on later this year. Gotcha. And then um, a brief question for both of you before we look back to Blair. Um, is it cost effective? And how did you decide whether or not it was? For us, um, if, if I could go first, I just. Um, as a kind of a personal interjection on the, on the cost effectiveness of this, actually, I think it's really important that the um, ISS was designate, designated a national lab. Um, because in this case, this is where the national labs are doing what they do best. They're doing something that uh, companies just can't do. They just can't do these, these kind of uh, large scale experiments. And um, they also help us through the results that, that we can uh, learn about at the national labs. They help us do more things faster and more cost effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so with, with that, we got a lot of help from cases. We, we are supporting um, the work with our own funds, but uh, in terms of the value that we get and in getting to an environment that is uh, previously uh, unattainable, like Gary said, we never even thought about the space station before. Um, the, uh, the value is tremendous, and so uh, for the experiment we're doing, I think it is very cost effective. Gotcha. And Gary, what can you say about the conversations at Delta Fawcett about the cost effectiveness of getting to space? Yeah, part of the, the cost was, uh, I don't know if it was uh, trying to get everybody interested, but uh, Casis and Zinn, I believe, who's building our test equipment, uh, all kind of pitched in and helped with the cost. We put funds into it as well. Uh, if we can improve on our designs and give us something that we think we could uh, make our customers happier and use more water more effectively, then yes, I think it would be a good investment. Um, and then Blair, I wanted you um, to talk a little bit about, um, you know, you obviously have like a two decade history in the making of being in space um, and have a close relationship with NASA, obviously with BEAM being um, a part of the space station now. Can you talk a little bit about um, your history with NASA and, um, and CASIS and how, um, you know, development and funding has kind of um, gotten to the point where it is? So the BEAM program was our first experience with NASA and uh, getting something to the ISS that is human rated is, is an incredibly arduous process and uh, I, I have to say that through that partnership, it was a public-private partnership which uh, we believe is a fabulous model going forward for uh, com commercial efforts in the future. We really learned that NASA is an incredible partner. They bring a lot to the table. And uh, this, 
this shift in the era of government controlled and owned and operated systems to commercially owned and operated systems isn't going to work without their support. So that program for us really opened the door, uh, had enormous priceless value to our company in, uh, in achieving what we were, we were able to do. Right. So obviously, make sure everyone can hear me. So obviously you guys are coming at this from two very different perspectives. You're talking about platforms and, and you guys are focused on doing research in space that has benefits here on the ground as well. Um, so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more, a bit more about how you see Bigelow developing platforms that might be useful to other commercial companies that are interested in doing this. Absolutely. So we were founded uh, not as a traditional government contractor, but to be a commercial provider of platforms in low Earth orbit and beyond. So supporting the science and the research that's going on uh, the International Space Station right now is, is pivotal to our future. The ISS represents a unique and an important asset and arguably the most important stepping stone towards this new era of commercial space that arguably exists in the world. And uh, without, without the work that's being done right now, um, our, our future would be a much bigger challenge to achieve. So um, as a platform provider, uh, the work that's being done with CASIS, the, the inroads that are being made, the relationships, the science and the research that's flying right now is absolutely uh, pivotal towards, towards folks like ourselves who want to be a part of the ISS transition and helping support NASA in, in transitioning to more deep space efforts and, and opening up LEO for more of a commercial presence. And what can you say about, uh, for other companies who might want to follow in Bigelow's footsteps, obviously if you're talking about having a presence in LEO and everyone talks about commercialization as having, you know, multiple, multiple efforts and, and multiple uh, footprints in this realm of commercialization. Um, can you talk a little bit about, since Bigelow has been at this for a while, what, what you would want other companies to know or what they should know about the difficulty and um, if any of Bigelow's trailblazing has kind of like led to a certain understanding of how difficult this is, anything you can share about this, those challenges of getting there in the first place? Well, I wouldn't be honest with you if I wasn't saying it's, it's hard and it's hard and, and it gets even harder. Um, this world is uh, governed by a lot of external forces, many of which are beyond your control. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a fluid kind of, of world. Uh, strategy can only take you so far uh, because the, there are other things at play that, that kind of dictate where our national space ambitions are going and uh, even other geopolitical forces that, uh, that we're having having to uh, contend with, but um, I think the most important thing is awareness that platforms are, are on the horizon, that the International Space Station exists. It's priceless in its ability for us to stimulate demand, gain experience in integration, learn about operations, build relationships, and, and really just um, the ultimate stepping stone towards the future. And looping back to you guys, talking about cost of effectiveness, cost effectiveness as well. Um, so the, there's talk, obviously, the Trump administration earlier this year proposed um, ending federal funding and handing over the International Space Station to private hands. Um, I'm curious from, from your perspective, obviously, net, with the current structure in place, CASIS and NASA help with you know, the transportation costs of getting to and from station, and then um, the astronauts who are paid with taxpayer dollars um, help carry out the experiments. I'm wondering if down the line, um, if you see it's still being cost effective, if it's completely commercial and there aren't those kind of like backstops to help cover the funds, um, or, or what you see down the line without station or with station in private hands, if it still makes sense to do. Let's start. Yeah, um, I think that's difficult to imagine how uh, a company, an individual company, or even a collection of companies can uh, or could uh, uh, mount a, a, an experiment that, that is really so 
costly in total. Mm -hmm. And so my, my response actually to, to your question is really uh, through the uh, mechanism I mentioned earlier about the role of the national labs in the uh, industrial economy. So, or the, the partnership actually between the government and uh, industry. So, um, I think there, as, as Blair was, was elaborating, there are, um, there has to, there have to be more players or, or more, continu uh, more um, uh, entities involved than just a, a commercial, uh, commercial opportunity. All right, Gary, over to you. Um, I don't know that they, it could be economically feasible, just from an engineering perspective. Our test unit is, it's a pretty simple test, um, but the test station itself is probably maybe three foot wide, five foot tall, foot and a half deep, something like that. But the engineering that goes involved in that is, is unbelievable. Uh, no company that I could think of would have the wherewithal to know what it takes to actually build that. For instance, we need about a liter and a half of water. You know, in my mind, a milk jug would work, but they can't do that on a space station. It's, there's a safety risk. You gotta make sure that nothing would ever in, you know, endanger any of the astronauts or anything. So that's not knowledge that's available to a typical company. So if a company is gonna try to do that, they're gonna invest so much time and money researching it and doing it right, and then you know, having to go back and redo it or if there's another company out there who would do that for people, it's gonna be pricey because the knowledge is difficult to get and cases and their supporting cast that they have doing this, is all, it's already there. They already have that knowledge. So for a company to pick it up, that, I think that would be pretty pricey. You may put it over where you can afford it. Yeah, I can, I can comment sure. on that. Blair. Um, that is why we view the payload developers that exist today and hopefully future companies that will exist in the future are going to have an incredibly important role in ensuring that all of the niche different types of, of I mean, you think about all the science that happens on the International Space Station right now. It's, it's huge and all of it is, is niche, very specific kinds of expertise that are required to support those payloads. And to think that a single company um, could support all of that, you know, it really, it doesn't make sense. So one of the things that we really appreciate that CASIS has enabled is the payload developer and implementation partner strata, because there is an enormous amount of, of support in engineering and, and development like you're mentioning. And so that piece is critical. On the other hand, it's, uh, our responsibility as platform providers to ensure that we can help you write the lowest possible check. So that's something that we focus on every single day. I think that's our number one mandate is to ensure that we can appeal to as many different kinds of markets as possible and we can allow people to spend at the least possible amount of money that they possibly can because for so long space has been such a cost prohibitive business Granted, the commercial era will, will be operating at an incredibly different dynamic cost metric, but even having said that, um, the expertise required to get research and science to a point where it can actually fly on station is going to be huge. So that's where we really want to empower all of the current payload developers and other interested parties that are considering to get into this field to focus on because that's going to be a really, really big strata within this whole ecosystem that we will rely on. And, you know, it'll, it'll be incredibly valuable uh, as, a, as another piece to this puzzle. There, there will be no single company that can accomplish getting the, the research to a, an actual payload, to the integration on a station, and then the station being owned and operated. There's many different pieces within, within this spectrum, and right now there's really only a handful of, of companies that have this expertise. So um, if, I could, if I could encourage those of you out there, that's one really important area that needs to get a lot more robust and needs to continue to grow and the ISS is the absolutely perfect platform to really kick that off. 
I also want to dive a little bit more um, into the nitty gritty with um, the payloads you guys are sending up, just to kind of flush out the idea of, of what it is companies are interested in doing. Um, so Derek, if you wanted to talk a little bit more, I understand that part of the, the deal with the research with silica is improving fuel efficiency, even with cars back here on Earth. Um, can you explain how that translates and how um, the microgravity environment is useful for studying this type of thing? Sure. Um, so. Uh Let's start with fuel economy, as you, you uh, asked. Uh, so one of the, uh, the benefits or one of the features of putting silica in tires is that it helps um, the tire to be more efficient. So we call that rolling resistance, but to most people that means miles per gallon. And, and so the, by, by lowering the energy lost by the tire, through um, manipulating the structure of silica, we can deliver greater fuel economy. Now, why does the, the other part of your question is, why does that happen? And the uh, feature uh, of silica is that um, the way I mentioned earlier, the way it arranges is very important to determining how the rubber in the tire interacts with the silica and leads to lower rolling resistance. So, by changing that structure, we know that by changing that structure, you can reduce uh, rolling resistance, increase fuel economy, but we don't fully understand how that all works. And so getting an insight into, say, something that's very different th than we currently experience allows us to learn some more and then take that to, uh, to the lab and see if we can replicate or understand why uh, that happens in, in such a way and create another mechanism or another pathway to that, that result. Um, and if, if I could, if you're interested, I mean, the, 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 in terms of the impact on, on the individual consumer. So um, uh, for most, most vehicles, most passenger cars, um, anywhere between something like 10 and 14% of the vehicle fuel efficiency um, is, uh, is devoted to the tires, is actually lost in, uh, in rolling the tires down the road. Um, and so, uh, interestingly, just here in California, um, a study was done that said, if you can reduce that number by 2%, um, then you could save annually somewhere like 300 million gallons of gasoline. And if you drive around, you saw the price of gas at the pump. You just do the multiplication to, to figure what that means in terms of money saved. But also, um, uh, that would lower CO2 emissions by another 3.3 million metric tons a year. So th that's how we see this research bringing value to us as a company, <coughs> but ultimately the user of our products. So we'll loop back to microgravity in one second. Um, but I also think it should be known, I was asking you backstage just to make sure both, this is for both of your companies, the very first time you're sending research payloads to station, but Goodyear would like everyone to know that there has been Goodyear tires on the moon. So not their first experience with, with space, <laughs> right. Um, and so, um, okay, let's go over to Gary. Why don't you talk a little bit about, um, I wanna, hand out this quote here from your press release today. It says, the experiment will leverage Delta Faucet Company's proprietary H2O kinetic technology to shed light on water flow and microgravity and how to deliver an enhanced shower experience for customers. Can you explain that? Uh, what is the H2O kinetic technology? And can you explain a little bit more about why microgravity is, is good for this type of work? Okay. The H2O kinetic technology uses a fluidic chip which is an oscillating chip. Uh, we've partnered with DLH Bowles to develop. The chip itself uh, is not a, your typical shower head. A typical shower head basically is a tin can with holes poked in it, and you know, water comes out. As the flow rates drop, you're either gonna have to have fewer nozzles or smaller nozzles, and the resulting shower is really pretty pathetic in a lot of cases, uh, particularly as those flow rates drop. The droplets get smaller, and the velocity is so low that uh, if you've seen some of the showers where the water just you know, drips off really badly. Uh, but the thing with the fluidic chips is we can control the droplet sizes so we can make the droplets bigger and we can increase the velocity so they're coming out faster. 
So what people feel is the momentum of the droplet, which is the mass times the velocity. Right now, we've had very good success with it. A lot of people really like it. You can get it to where you almost peel paint with them. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, but as the flow rates drop, we want to make sure that we can continue to provide a good shower head even at lower flow rates. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what the boundaries are. The breakup of water droplets through a, a standard orifice, just going through a little hole, is fairly well understood. We really don't know what, how, what, how that works on a fluidic chip. It's unknown. Even on the uh, chip, though, or on the standard needle jet, rather, all the formulas, none of them include a gravitational constant in the formulas to predict what the droplet size will be, uh, which would indicate that maybe gravity doesn't have an input, input to all this, how it works. We don't know that. So until we test it, we don't know if these chips can be improved beyond what they're already performing. So that's what we're looking for. And then um, to kind of loop up with everyone. Blair, um, why don't you kind of give us an idea of what Bigelow is interested in doing next and looking forward to these next years, which many consider are very crucial to kind of doing this um, heavy commercialization of LEO. What are you looking to do next? What's your primary focus going forward? Sure. So um, the B330 is uh, a good analogy is that's like our, our 747 spacecraft. We envision producing these space stations on somewhat of a production line. And uh, that's something we are, that's Bigelow Aerospace's number one focus right now. And the, the beauty of the B330 is that it's based on the expandable technology, which was originally uh, conceived through NASA. This is not something that, that we started. The program is called TransHab. And TransHab's purpose was to uh, basically transit humans to Mars because this technology has uh, many superior facets to it that, far, uh, that are far better than, than the metallic systems that currently exist in terms of volume, in terms of radiation protection, and, and MMOD production. And so it's a spacecraft that has uh, diverse uses in low Earth orbit for commercialization and for uh, deep space human exploration. So that's, that's Bigelow Aerospace's main focus right now. Uh, Bigelow Space Operations is um, avidly pursuing flying commercial payloads to the ISS. And there's also a really exciting program that we're working on right now that unfortunately I can't talk about quite yet. But stay tuned, that, that news will, will come out in a bit. Um, but we see this, this time in spaceflight as one of the most critical times that's probably ever happened. And the decisions that are made and the, the events that happen over the next few years will absolutely define the next decades, if not the next century to come. So our company is, is hoping to be a part of that future. We're hoping to be platform providers that are reliable, affordable, and can accommodate a diverse use of activities for companies and countries that have space ambitions and, and want a space future. And then, uh, Derek, uh, why don't you tell me, can you share when you guys are launching the station and when exactly you expect to get your first results and how quickly you foresee the technology being implemented into Goodyear products? Sure. Um, well, I, I'm not exactly sure of the, the precise launch date. We're target, targeted uh, before the end of the year. I think it's in the um, late fall uh, is what we expect. Um, but the, the experiment is going to uh, stay up there for um, quite a while, it turns out. Um, but that's really just because of the, the mechanics of getting, um, getting things up and, and back from the uh, ISS. It actually, the experiment itself actually is going to take um, uh, a couple of days. Uh, and um, that's an, another reason for, for doing it on the space station, actually, is that um, you can't experience microgravity for that length of time anywhere else. So uh, once, the, once the experiment's completed, it'll, um, the, the materials are going to be uh, flash frozen to preserve everything in the, in the state that we, uh, that we want to examine them when they come back to Earth. They'll come back, they'll come back to our lab in Akron, Ohio. Uh, our scientists are then going to do some characterization 
to, to figure out what we got, uh, what we got in the experiment that, that was done. Um, after that, uh, I think, like you heard from many of the other speeches, speakers this morning, it's going to be more questions. So we will uh, we'll, we'll need to understand, if we get a, a positive result, we'll need to understand how to, uh, how to use that. How do we take it to um, a, a more industrial scale? Uh, Goodyear doesn't make that material. We, but it's fundamental to us to understand why and how it works. So we'll have to then work, if we find new knowledge, we'll share it, and then we'll uh, find a way to produce that material. So um, I think you can tell it, it's not going to be a, a rapid pathway to, uh, to uh, implementation in tires, but I think it's a very uh, practical and realistic pathway that we're going to learn more, test more, and then ex uh, expand uh, the utilization once we found something positive. Do you see uh, more utilization of station down the road, possibly for other types of experiments? Yeah, um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, uh, th this experiment was designed just as a, as a sort of a what if. And, and so once we complete that, there are going to be more detailed uh, experiments required to fully understand and capture all, most of the knowledge needed to, to uh, develop and implement it uh, on Earth. And of course, back in our organization, I'm sure once the teams hear about this, you know, the, then the, um, the wheels will start turning and, and people may think about other experiments that we want to uh, try in, in orbit. Gotcha. And then, um, Gary, pretty much same line of questioning for you. Uh, when's, when's launch and then how soon can you see um, the results of the experiment being implemented into Delta Fawcett products? I think our launch is the first half of September, or September, I'm sorry, November. Uh, but it might even be the same one you're on, maybe. Uh, basically, the test is going to take very little time, like a day or something. So when they have all that downloaded, they can uh, send it down to us, and we can analyze it pretty quickly. Uh, so they could probably take a week, say, to compile it and review it. And then once you get the information, though, now you've got to look and see if you can make any changes. So there'll be a lot of... Um, design work to try to do that. So I think we can get the data really quickly a couple weeks after launch, but then implementing it and testing it is going to take you know, six months probably, I would guess. And then um, just to follow up, I, I'm not sure if I can say the exact price point, but I know that you guys received significant subsidies, and that, you told me that was a big reason yeah. why this was so cost effective. So status quo, or given that same opportunity, um, do you foresee additional uh, research happening at station for you guys in the near future? I think we would certainly be looking at that. You know, mm -hmm. if it would make sense and there would be some benefit to Delta and the comp and the world in general. I mm -hmm. mean, it, I think if we, particularly in sustainability and conservation of water, I think it would be behoove everybody <laughs> to do that. All right, um, so I know that we're, everyone is probably anxious to get to lunch, but I know that I'm supposed to ask if there are audience questions, and I believe that there were supposed to be um, questions filed on the app. So I wanted to pass it over. Are they? Getting signal? There are. OK, so we pass it over to some folks in the back. Good morning. Uh, so I think we just heard an answer to one of them from, uh, from uh, Delta. But we had the same question for Goodyear. Do you have a long-term plan to continue to do research in space as part of your R&D strategy? I, I think uh, right now um, this is a, a, a really an opportunistic event for us. We're very happy that we got this chance to, to work uh, through CASIS and, and uh, fly this experiment. Um, once we get it back and it is, uh, let's, it is positive, we hope it will be, then we're going to have to figure out the way to, to learn more. That might involve uh, more microgravity and or more experiments in microgravity, in which case we're going to have to justify that and figure out how to get the results. Okay. And uh, for Paul and Derek, again, someone was curious, how long was it from the time that you first had your idea for an experiment to getting it manifested for flight? Uh, for us, it was, it was about a year and a half to two years. I can't remember exactly. But they, you know, they had some... Uh, issues with the development of the test station itself. Uh, but I think it was about a year, year and a half. 
something like that. Because there were some meetings between cases and Zen and us, and just a discussion to make sure everything was done right and it was something everybody needed. So. Yeah, uh, similar, similar time frame for us, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we, we did some work internally to, to develop an idea that, um, that, seemed vi that was viable. Um, then with cases and with, uh, um, actually it turns out we worked with more than one implementation provider to just um, uh, develop the idea and turn it into something that could be done um, safely. Uh, because originally we, we were thinking of flying um, a couple of liters of ethanol, uh, which when, didn't work out. <laughs> uh, um, it's, and so we had to modify the ex experiment. Our, our guys in the lab had to do some more work uh, to, to fit in with the capabilities. So um, quite a, a, a long elapsed time of maybe a, a couple of years or so, um, but it was all very, uh, uh, very focused activity and, and directed to, um, to getting something um, that the, the can be uh, launched and, and tested. Ethanol doesn't sound rusky at all. <laughs> I'm not sure why that didn't work. Okay, and a question for Blair. Uh, what do you see as the single biggest barrier to achieving your commercial strategy, and what can CASIS or NASA do to help with that? Boy, um, give me a sec. Um, you know, I. I've been in this industry full time for about three years now, and I really have to give uh, I have to give um, credence where it's due to the fact that even in this short time I've been in this industry, I've seen a shift towards the support of commercialization, uh, the focus on trying to stimulate demand, and a lot of these really big questions that have kind of you know, been uh, ignored for a while that are, that are starting to become really hot items. So I've seen a, a big willingness to support this new commercial era and to create more public-private partnerships. So um, there, are, and there, there are always obstacles in, in anything that you're trying to achieve, especially if you're trying to be a trailblazer or if you're doing novel things. But I have to say that the amount of support that we've gotten from CASIS and from NASA over the past few years has, has just been invaluable. So um, I would say the future is looking bright. Like I mentioned, this is a very pivotal time in human spaceflight. The decisions that are made over the next few years are going to be absolutely critical. I have a lot of respect for the way that, that NASA is handling uh, big topics right now, like ISS transition and a lot of respect for, for CASIS and the way that um, they're, they're trying to support folks like us who are really, really focused on creating the demand, spreading awareness, and trying to get non-traditional companies into this area because without that, there, there isn't going to be uh, this commercial low, low Earth orbit economy that, that we talk so often about. Do you have any more else? Okay, I can ask one more. Uh, someone asked, did Delta or Goodyear encounter any intellectual property issues? We did not. Uh, the technology is, is patented at this point, uh, but no, there was no patent issues. Um, similar, similarly for us, um, the arrangements have been very favorable uh, for Goodyear that uh, if, if there is intellectual property, we, which we don't know right now, well, we, get to, we get to use that. Um, but um, as I mentioned before, we're, we're not a maker of this material. We just need to understand better how to, how to make it. And so we'll, we'll need to uh, uh, share that in some way or other uh, with people who can provide the material on an industrial scale. Would you like another? Do you guys want to take another? All right, let's do one more. OK, for Blair, um, does Bigelow Aerospace have any plans for habitats on Mars? Um, well, uh, like I mentioned before, TransHab, uh, the TransHab program that NASA was responsible for, the purpose of the technology was, was for transit to Mars. And there were absolutely concepts for uh, surface habitats for that purpose. 
Our, our company's focus is primarily on the moon. Uh, the moon is our own backyard. It has a landmass of North and South America combined. It has uh, an invaluable amount of resources, uh, water ice, helium-3. Uh, it, it makes the most sense for us uh, with our strategic planning um, in, the long, in the long term, not the short term, to, to have the moon as an end goal. So yes, we have concepts for, for surface habs, but our primary focus right now is uh, getting to low Earth orbit, getting comfortable, understanding those operations, proving out systems, and hopefully creating platforms for many researchers, scientists, payload developers, and um, pretty much everything in between, uh, from entertainment to marketing and branding and advertising, and basically anyone who wants a space future. We want to be able to find ways for them to write checks that they can afford to have some kind of, of, of space presence. All right, thanks so much to my panel. Huge, huge, huge thank you. Thanks to all of you.